class, I used to say that I only go over this so that you guys will know, those of you that are not going into hand therapy, that you know what they are, how to recognize them, and to know that you're not ready to treat these things. And then I started getting calls from previous graduates, freaking out because they were like four days into their career as an OT and they had a tendon repair on their, on their caseload in a general outpatient clinic with no CHT working with them. So who knows if you'll see them or not. Um, but these are things, and the reason why I say that you wouldn't see them is because these are things that you can muck up and the patient would need surgery. So there are things that you have to be very careful with and make sure that you, you kind of know what you're doing so that you don't muck it up, okay? So we're gonna start talking about flexor tendons and lacerations and ruptures and then how what protocols are for after repair. So our flexor tendons, again, would be on our flexor side. So things I'm talking about would be FDP, FDS. Flexor digitorum profundus, flexor digitorum superficialis. And these are, these are commonly cut because people are holding a beer bottle and maybe had, shouldn't have been because they already had too many, right? And they fall and glass cut in the hand. Um, or people get mad and throw a bottle. Like there's a lot of, but, but also we cut knives. And you know, we have to cook dinner and the meat's not totally thawed. You know, you're trying to break it apart with a knife in your hand and your knife, your hand slides down the knife, you know. Or you get that new pocket knife for Christmas and you're 12 and you close <laughs> it on your own finger, right? Like pop, pumpkin cutting issues, um, squash cutting issues. I've had people that are cleaning out a deer and the other person, they're doing it together and one person cuts the other person's hand. I've had people that were husband and wife team doing landscaping and they cut the other person's hand. Um, like just all kinds of things. But these are very common, common things that happen that we see, okay? So how they're treated depends on where the cut happens, okay? And sometimes it can be confusing of where the cut happened because we know that our tendons glide back and forth. So I may have cut something with my hand tightly fisted around a small knife or pumpkin carving tool, right? Um, so my, my, my tendon had glided, so the, the wound might be down here, but the tendon was cut up here. That's kind of dramatic, but you see what I'm saying? The wound may not be where the tendon was cut because of the position of the hand, but it was cut. So we, we label zones of injury. So the first thing that I want to know when I'm getting a tendon referral is I want to know what zone did the laceration take place in? Because that's gonna dictate my protocol and it's gonna tell me how hard it's gonna be and lots of things, okay? So the, on the molar side of the hand, it's kind of difficult to remember where these zones are. The dorsal side is much easier, which I'll show you. But zone one is the FDS insertion to the distal aspect of the finger. Okay? Zone two is from the A1 pulley, which is down here. People are really calling me, and that's an 897 number. I don't know who that is. Um, up to here. So it would be zone two. Because we know where our A1 pulleys are. Remember, that's our trigger finger pulley. Right? Um, and FDS only goes just past the PIP. And the profundus, remember? becomes profound and becomes superficial, and then that goes to the end of the finger. Zone three is the distal end of the carpal tunnel to the A1 pulley. And I think I have a picture in here. Yeah. And zone four is within the carpal tunnel, and zone five then would be more a forearm tendon laceration. Okay? 
So in general, the more proximal the cut, the better the outcome, the easier the patient is to treat. So if I had the choice of where my flexor tendon was going to be cut, I'm hoping for zone, i take zone 3, 4, or 5, okay? i take, I mean, I would prefer zone 5, but I would take the others. The worst areas are up here, but that's where our fingers are, so you think that's one of the most common places that get cut. And then, since the thumb is a different anatomy, the one, two, and three are just described differently. Okay? So here's, oh, yeah, I did have a picture. Here's a nice picture that shows where all the zones are. So anything past zone three is more complicated. Okay, any questions about the zones? Pretty straightforward, right? Here's where it gets a little bit mucky, okay? So when the tendon is, gets cut, you know, the tendon, it might get cut or it might get ruptured, right? But when the tendon gets cut apart, two pieces sewn back together, right? We want the two ends of the tendon to heal back together, okay? So there's two different types of healing. Okay, intrinsic healing occurs between the two ends, right? We want intrinsic healing. We encourage it. We want to do anything that we can do to make sure I increase intrinsic healing. This, remember that healing fluid, why we do these differential glides to get the FDS moving for trigger fingers, right? That healing fluid, um, provides nutrition to help facilitate this tendon healing, right? And it also keeps it from gliding, okay? So what's really critical is when I want to bend my finger, my muscle contracts and that tendon has to glide up and down. It's critical. If it doesn't glide, it doesn't bend, okay? What happens additionally is this extrinsic healing, where adhesions form between the tendon and all of the stuff around it, okay? And this can prevent the tendon from gliding. So what do you think are big things that can impact this extrinsic healing that we can control? Edema. The more edema, the more extrinsic healing which when you think healing, you think, oh, that's good. It's not good, because I'm not going to glide, okay? The more edema, the more extrinsic healing, the more trouble that patient's going to have, the worse the outcome. Okay? What's that? So it's bad. It's bad. Bad. Because our tendons have to glide. If, if they don't glide, they're of no value. No value. I might as well not have had the surgery, right? Um, so we want to do things to eliminate or decrease extrinsic healing. What is something else that we can't control that could impact extrinsic healing? Damage to other um, structures. Other structures. If I have a fracture at the same site, I cut my blood vessel, I have a nerve laceration, all that scar is trying to heal everything and it's going to stick it all together and I'm going to get a ton of extrinsic healing and I'm not going to glide. Okay? What else that we cannot control can impact extrinsic healing? Age. Um, I would say that's true. Yep. I don't know for sure why with scar adhesions, but young patients do so much better than older patients. Tendon repair. They have a better outcome naturally. Remember, I talked about the skill of the surgeon. Every time the patient, the doctor, handles the tendon with a surgical instrument, it's an opportunity for extrinsic healing. Every time the doctor grabs the tendon to suture, 
It's an opportunity for extrinsic healing. So skill of the surgeon is very important, very important. You want someone to, to repair these tendon ends together that does it all the time. You don't want a general orthopedic who's used to doing knees and hips and has a slow caseload and takes on a tendon laceration because he's got an opening in the schedule, right? Or sometimes, like I used to work with a surgeon in Ohio and he was a hand surgeon, he was board certified in hand surgery, but he could make more money profit from treating the bigger joints like hips and knees than the hand cases. So he would do a lot of hips and knees, and then he loved hands, so he would still do them, but he cheated on his first wife, he had alimony, he's got like 10 kids, and so he, money was a critical thing for him, right? right. So he would take, he would take um, tons of lower extremity cases and then still maintain his hand business. And his patients did not have good outcomes. And I think because it's so hard to vary what you do. If you're used to swinging a hammer all day, it's hard to do needlepoint, you know? And that's how I would portray the two things so differently, you know? So we want to increase intrinsic healing, limit extrinsic healing with these tendon repairs. And now here we say, oh my gosh, it's gonna talk about the phases of healing again, right? But it's important in wounds, okay? Because in the beginning, we're trying to get out all this inflammatory tissue, right? Then we start to have repair. But this fibroplasia day, which is where I start to, my tissue starts to grow together, right? Is this, this is a critical thing to look at. Day five to day 21. Again, this is variable. And then I have collagen remodeling and maturation day 21 to six months. So six months, is a long time, right? <coughs> so, and then you have these other factors that even impact intrinsic healing, like the general health of the patient, um, um, how the patient is doing with all of this. You know, some patients handle it better than others. Um, the age of the patient, are they a smoker? Are they a diabetic? Those are all things that we can't control, but can impact the intrinsic healing rate, how fast they intrinsically heal, the tendon heals together. I was wondering, like, I don't know if this is a thing, but so age would affect it because as we age, our body gives less collagen. Right. Um, is there anything that a surgeon could give somebody to promote collagen production or? No, they tried them? doing some, like, you know, we have the, um, the neur neural tubes. I'm like, can't they make some kind of a tube that's going to go over the end of the, the tendon repair to keep it from that extrinsic healing, you know? But they've tried these things, but nothing has been Well, and it has to glide, it has to slide under um, pulley systems. It's all this intricate anatomy. It has to glide because the FDS and the FTP glide over top of one another. So there's all of these variables that a lot of tension all the time. And like tension and force. Yeah. So it's really a difficult thing. So all these things. Socioeconomic. Can the patient come to therapy? Can they afford their proper splint? Do they have to keep working while they're healing from their tendon repair? So they have increased edema, they can't follow the, their whole program, they can't go to therapy because they have two jobs and they're a single parent, right? Those all impact things. Timing of the repair, you want to have the repair done within two weeks of the laceration. Why do you think that's critical? What do you think about that? Your body just start naturally doing things No, something else. So the tendons together, pop goes the tendon. What's going to happen down here? Shortening. Adaptive shortening, right? Adaptive shortening will happen with the muscle and they won't be able to bring the two ends back together. So all these crazy things happen. So if you caught your tendon, you gotta get it repaired in two weeks. 
you can't go on vacation, I'll deal with it when I get back, right? You've got to get it repaired right away. Okay, so our whole goal in this process, and what happens is with these patients is the doctor does a surgical repair and then he sends them to you to take care of everything else, okay? Now there are already some factors that we can't control, right? Skill of the surgeon, is the patient cooperative? Are they, you know, are they, can they not be compliant because of other external factors in your life? You know, all these things. But there are a lot of things that we can control. And I, I went to a class one time and the, the doctor referred to this as like a dance between the surgeon and the therapist. Neither one, nothing can be successful if you don't have both on the same team working together. The surgeon has to do their part and the therapist has to do their part to work together with this whole thing. So we want to have um, good post-op management. That's our part, right? We want to have gentle tendling, tendon handling on the part of the surgeon which we cannot control, right? And then there's been all kinds of research out there looking at, well, if I put more suture strands together back and forth between the tendon ends, can I move them quicker? But then I create too much bulk and the tendon won't glide under the pulley and it can get stuck and trigger almost, right? So there's all these factors, but what is typical is four strand techniques. Four strand techniques is what's typical, meaning four sutures going back and forth between the two ends of the tendons to hold it together. So things that we have to consider is that the zone of the laceration may not match the site of the, the incision on the hand because the hand might have been flexed. And zone two, which is this area, which is where a ton of flexor tendons occur, we call no man's land. Because no man or woman wants to cut their tendon in zone two. Because it's considered the worst outcomes. You have the FDP and the FDS riding within a tendon sheath together, gliding over top of one another. Um, just lots of factors that impede um, or increase the tendency for extrinsic healing. So um, we call zone two no man's land, and that's something that you'll want to know for the test, okay? Zone two. Zone two is the scary zone. Zone two, you do the best you can and, and you know, hope the patient gets gliding. So our whole goal is to restore the gliding, restore the gliding, increase range of motion and increase functional use. But with tendons, the gliding is critical. The gliding doesn't occur if there's too much extrinsic healing. So um, we have to do things to get the gliding. Passive range of motion will not increase tendon. So if I take my other hand and I bend my own fingers into a flexed position, my tendons on the inside just kind of wiggle up like cooked spaghetti would be. Like if you had spaghetti cooked in there and you just bowled it up, it's not gonna glide through, right? They just wiggle up in there like cooked spaghetti. They don't glide, okay? The only way to make it glide is to actively contract your muscle, pulls on the tendon, and glides back and forth. So if you have a gliding problem, you can do passive range of motion until you're blue in the face, and it will not improve your gliding. So there's electrical stimulation of that muscle belly? Electrical stimulation of the muscle belly might help. Our key is we want active range of motion. But there's this gentle balance because we need to protect the repair. Because if I, if I actively move it too early, sometimes the tendon might gap because it's too much force on it, and then it ruptures later, or it might rupture at the time that you do active motion. 
So it's this gentle balance where surgeons have tried to get patients to move as quickly as they can, but we already saw that fibroplasia stage is day five to day 21. If I wait three weeks before I and keep it solid and don't move it, how much extrinsic healing is going to occur? How much scar do you feel, Susie, in your wrist, and how many weeks post-op are you? Um, like a month, at least. So you're like, so, big scar. Yeah. So if we just let that tendon sit there for three weeks and not move it, you're going to get so much extrinsic healing, it's not going to glide. It's not going to glide. So then what we do is we try to come up with different protocols and different ways so surgeons increase the number of strands between the tendons so we can move them early, but then it created too much bulk. So the research shows that if you do a four strand repair that you should be able to do active range of motion, gentle active range of motion right away. But I can tell you in West Michigan, I never have had a doctor that has allowed me to do active range of motion right away. Because they're scared that we're gonna to do too much and the patient's gonna rupture. And when they rupture, it's not a cut, it's a fray. Then they have to cut the end off, cut the end off. Maybe they can't get the two ends back together. They have to take a tendon graft. You see, you see what I'm saying? It's a big deal. If the tendon ruptures, it's a big, giant deal. And sometimes it may rupture, like nothing that, you may have followed an early active range of motion and got them moving. They went home and were kind of a knucklehead and grabbed something that they weren't supposed to grab. Tendon ruptures, but they sue the doctor. You know? And so with this whole litigious community that we live in, um, I never get patients to do early active motion. They're the doctors, and actually this doctor's demystified course, I think two years, last year it was on bone, and the year before it was on tendon, and they would say things like, and, and these are all local docs at the conference, and they would say things like, yeah, with the four strain repair you should be able to, do you, I don't get your patients, you know, right away to move them right away. They don't do it. Um, if you were at a big research institution, they, you would probably be more likely to see that. Cleveland Clinic, Mayo, Indiana Hand Center, Philadelphia Hand Center. You might see some more proactive things like that. But even when I worked at U of M, I didn't get people that were moving early active. The doctors are fearful of litigation. And that's the root. It's unfortunate, you know. Um, okay, so complications, like I talked about, a gap formation. A gap can occur and then rupture later. You can rupture the tendon. Scar adhesions can limit glide, that's that extrinsic healing, right? Infection, and then when you have other injuries, it just mucks up everything and creates more extrinsic healing and more complications. So our goal initially is to provide protection with the splint. So we know if we keep things on a slack, it's going to be protected, right? So if we look at our flexors, our, our FTP and FDS, those two finger flexors, are those intrinsic or extrinsic muscles? Extrinsic, yes. So do I need to include the wrist in the splint. Yes. yes. So I know I need to include the wrist and the fingers in the splint. So if I look at my skin and I bend it this way, my skin wrinkles, right, and puckers. It's on a slack. I could probably even pick some skin up, right? It's on a slack. If I go straight, it's more taut. And if I go like this, it's tight, extrinsically. Right? So this is a position of protection following tendon repair. This is a no-no. Okay? This protects it. If I do this with my patient, I just 
either ruptured their tendon or I created a gap that's going to rupture later. Okay? Flex, it just makes common sense though, right? Look at your skin. My flexor tendons, I know, they originate at my lateral epicondyle, form muscle belly, form tendon, go under my carpal tunnel, come up and flex my digits. It makes sense. You can feel it, that they're, on, they're loose here, they're stretched there, right? So this is that position of protection, okay? We're always going to um, control edema. I can't stress that enough, right? Um, get the wounds to heal. Maintain motion in other joints. When a patient has a tendon repair, they're not reaching up to get a cup out of the cupboard with this arm. They're not reaching overhead to get a sweater out of the, out of the cabinet, right? So you got to keep their shoulder moving, keep their elbow. They might hold it like this all the time to keep it elevated. They're going to not be able to extend their elbow. Um, maintaining digital passive range of motion in the plane allowed. So what do our tendons do when I do passive range of motion? My, so if I take my small finger and I flex it like here, what happens to my tendon? It just wiggles like cooked spaghetti. Am I at risk for breaking it apart? No. You can flex those fingers till the cows come home and you are never going to hurt the tendon repair. Okay? You may hurt the patient because they're swollen, they are having pain, so we're going to be cognizant of that and not going to, you know, you're not going to crank on them. So that will create more edema. More edema creates more scar, more extrinsic healing, less gliding, poorer outcome, right? So I can do passive range of motion in planes that are allowed, fine. I can flex the wrist. Passively, I'm not going to hurt the repair. Does that make sense? Some of you have puzzle books on here. I can do passive flexion of the fingers. I am not going to hurt the repair. What about if I did passive wrist extension? Pop goes the tendon. What if I did passive digit extension? Pop goes the tendon. What if I did both at the wrong, the same time? I should turn in my OT license now before I injure others, right? But passive flexion, you can see the tendons just wiggle up in there. I'm not going to hurt them. And it's our responsibility then to let the patients know, it, you may feel pain, but I, I, we are not hurting your repair. It's just wiggling up in there like cooked spaghetti, okay? Do not worry, you may feel pain, but I'm not stressing your repair. So if my patient takes the splint off because they want to wash their hand, I have them hold their other hand like this and have a family member wash it. I don't let them have any control over, oh, someone knocks on the doorbell, oh, who's here, right? I, no control. I put their arm in a protected position and they just cradle it and wash their hand this way, so I have no risk of doing this, okay? Um, prevent flexion contractures. So you know that extrinsic muscle? If I, if I flex the wrist really good, they might be able to straighten their fingers better. I don't want to get a PIP joint flexion contracture, right? So use that extrinsic thing in your mind to help you. Right? If I flex the fingers, you know, well, that's make any sense. But if I if I'm worried about digit contractures, then I can flex the wrist and allow them to extend better. <coughs> My biggest thing is to, I want to get some glide. Um, and the, another big thing is the patients are not educated about anything by the surgeon, from my experience. Okay. The doctor sends them to you two days post-op, three days post-op to get their protective splint fabricated, right? And you have to educate them on the protocol. You have to educate them on how to take care of their dressing, how to take care of their sutures, everything. And sometimes the doctor may have told them some things, but they just had surgery. They're drugged. They don't remember that, you know? So we have to educate them.
It does, but you're taking the slack off it. Okay. Yeah. Flexing that wrist maximally, um, but this would be bad. Yeah. So here are our treatment goals. And the whole time, since I've just scared the life out of you, right, they're going to be worried, did I rupture the patient's tendon, right? One easy way to know that is to look at the cascade of the hand at rest. Because when my hand rests, it just looks like that. If I ruptured my tendon, it's going to look like that. It's not going to bend normally. So if you're worried, you know, or if your patient's worried, that's one thing that you can know. But if you have them do a cascade and it looks like that, you better call the doctor. Or you ask the patient, did you take your splint off? Did you grab something that you shouldn't have? And it's not just with this hand. Like, I don't know how much of you have done heavy work, but I do a lot of it. <laughs> so if I'm carrying, oh, I just happen to have this here. If, say this is 30 pound, okay? If I'm carrying a 30 pound bucket, what do I do? I counterbalance. So even if I'm doing heavy weight on my uninjured side, I counterbalance with my other side and I contract it, right? I contract it, which would create a muscle contraction, which could gap my tendon or rupture it. So I, you know, patients would think, oh, I can go back to work and I'll just do one-handed work. And they're carrying ladders around and heavy stuff. No, 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 I tell my patients, don't do anything heavy, because when you do heavy with the side, you contract on the other side to countervalent and you can rupture your tendon, okay? Um, and here is another thing. The strength of the tendon actually decreases during that remodeling phase, that, that fibroplasia phase, and then gets stronger again. So like when you look at bone and fracture healing, it gets stronger, stronger, stronger. So you would think, Oh, my fracture is like three weeks out. I should be having some good healing going on, right? But with tendon repairs, that's not what happens. The strength of the tendon day seven goes down and then goes back up, right? So those patients that had surgery and then were supposed to come to you day two after surgery, but they didn't because they went to Aruba for a week, right? And then they come back to you in their day nine, and the doctors wanted to do an early active motion therapy because you were in a dynamic place, like at Mayo Clinic, right? But now I'm in this bad zone. Do I want to move it now? It already had extrinsic healing occurring between that day one and day nine. If I move it now, it may rupture. So you have to know that the strength of tendon actually decreases before it goes up, and that's, tendon is tendon, whether it's in the knee, whether it's in the hand, whether it's in the shoulder. So when you look at protocols for shoulder repair, which we're gonna be covering those soon, when you look at rotator cuff repairs, and you look at when you can start to do more things, it's after day 21, because a tendon is a tendon, whether it's in the shoulder, the knee, or the hand. And they all decrease healing before, and decrease strength before they go up. And I tell my patients this. So when do you think the most likely time that a patient's tendon will rupture? Day seven to day 21, during that phase where it's the weakest. That's your scary time. After day 21, it slowly gets stronger, 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 stronger. But it doesn't get to strength of like return to sports till usually like 12 weeks post-op. Return to heavy work. And these are the things that we have to educate our patients on because they, they think in a couple weeks I'm going back to work. No, you're not. A couple weeks, your tendon is still in the danger zone, right? Not until, so I think I have what's typical. 
So let's move on with the, so I can try to follow the sort of the PowerPoint with my talk. So um, when we get the referral, there's different ways that we can handle them. Either they're immobilized, they get early passive motion, where we do passive flexion, and in in the plane is allowed, or we do early active motion. So the doctor has to decide what the course for this patient is going to be. And they'll take into account a lot of patient factors, right? What if you think a five, what if a five-year-old, and this happens, caught their tendon? Which phase do you think would be best? Immobilization, right? Kids do great with better outcomes. He's not going to follow directions, right? Is he going to follow directions to not do this? No. So children usually are immobilized. Now a teen might be able to follow directions. Maybe it's not a boy teen, right? <laughs> because sometimes they take a little bit longer to get the whole um, <laughs> judgment thing. Just, you know, sometimes boy teens make kind of knucklehead choices, right? So a girl teen, you might be able to do some of these, but otherwise kids the mobilization. Early passive motion would be typical, the research shows, if you have less than a four strand repair. And so the research tells us to do all this early active motion. But I already told you, I don't get referrals for that. I get all my referrals for this. Unless they're a kid, all my referrals come for the early passive motion. So it's frustrating because you know that this extrinsic healing is occurring. They had a forced hand repair. I should be able to do early active, but the doctor has my hands tied, right? So, so there's different protocols. And so with the early active motion, our goal, they've done research that shows different techniques of motion and how much millimeters of tendon glide that you get with different things and how much you want to prevent that extrinsic healing, right? So they say, now we can't cut the hand open and see or tag it, you know, and see, well, how much millimeters of glide did I get? But our goal is to have 1.7 millimeters of tendon glide to prevent adhesions from developing. And the best way to do that is to start with early active. If you're gonna do early active though, you have to do it in the first five days because we know day seven, it starts to dip down the strength and we do not want to start an early active motion protocol anytime between day 7 and day 21 for sure. Okay? So if the patient was late for the referral, you have no option but the early passive motion protocol. Yeah? Can you explain why we would start at four or five days? But, I mean, is it, is it strictly because of adhesion formation? Strictly because of adhesion. Is that why it's trying to close down? Even if you start early? That isn't why the strength goes down. The tendon healing naturally, the strength goes down. But the reason why we want to start it early is to prevent that adhesion from occurring. Uh, and the best way for the tendon to glide, like I said, is active motion. Because with passive, it wiggles up. Like I'm just kind of like confused why we would start it within the first five days, I get that, but why we would continue during the uh, because then you've already kept those adhesions from adhering, okay. so you're gliding. So you're still weak, but you don't have the But you don't like have the these barriers okay. pulling on it. Yeah. Okay? So there is some studies that have shown that you do get a little glide with passive motion. That's why we do some. But we don't get this 1.7 millimeters. But we'll take what we can get, and we'll start, if we can, early passive motion, which is what's most typical. Sometimes you'll get early active. I would love to work with, ten, with docs that always gave me early active, because those patients are much more fun, much less frustrating for the patient and the therapist. Yeah. Can you start it within the first five days? Can you keep going like that? Yes, or keep going. Talking? That's kind of what. And if you guys can't hear a question, I was doing a, a classroom observation a couple weeks ago, and I couldn't hear the people in the front when they ask questions. So if you can't hear, I'll repeat the question or whatever. I need to get, I guess, in the habit of doing that because I didn't realize how hard it is in the back to hear when people ask a question. But sometimes it depends on who talks. But. Okay, 
So then, because there's no good way, like when there's a good way, then everyone does the same way. When there's no good way, right, then everyone comes up, tries to go with their own different way because there's no perfect way. So there's lots of different protocols for flexor tendon repairs that we're going to go through. General protocol, okay, week zero to three, because I want to get past day 21. All I do is put them in a dorsal forearm base splint in that position of protection, okay? And I do passive flexion of the digits and active extension to the limits of the splint. So I passively flex, they actively extend to the limits of the splint. I passively flex, and I might do each finger separately. So, because maybe each finger can't bend the same amount, right? Passive flexion of the digits, active extension to the limit of the splint, okay? At week three, because I'm past day 21, right? I can start to do active range of motion. Now, I put different things, tendon glides, place and hold, differential glide, blocking exercises, because all of those give a varied amount of force onto the tendon, right? So here's what I do. My patient comes in, because I have doctors that won't refer for early active, I do this early passive. I, get their, I keep their passive range of motion good by doing passive range of motion religiously so that their joints are supple. So when I get the okay to start this active motion, I'm not fighting against stiffness, right? I want to just get gliding, because I've been waiting to glide for three weeks, right? A little gliding does occur with this passive flexion. That's one of the reasons we do it. The other reason is to keep the joints supple while we're waiting to really do some big gliding, right? So when I first start to, to do active motion, I don't start with blocking. I don't start with tending glides, right? I start with, I put their hand into a fist, and I ask them to hold it and then straighten up again. And I always, this is what I say to my patients, is I always use the analogy because everyone, it's hard for you as a therapist to control how hard they're gonna squeeze, right? Some people might be like they're crushing something and some people will hardly give any effort at all. So I use the analogy of that you're just holding a baby chick. You know, you don't want to kill the chick, right? And you don't want to drop the chick, right? So I use the analogy, I love analogies because I think patients really get it then, you know? Just, I'm gonna, I brought your fingers down into a fist and we're gonna do our first squeeze, right? And I want you to hold the baby chick and now release it. And I'm gonna bring you back down again, hold the baby chick and release it. So the key is a gentle hold. And then, as now that I'm past day 20, 21, I know my tendons are going to get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger, and I gradually increase the force that I give it. we have gone past the chick, right? Do you also increase the force by like moving the wrist and flexion and then back slowly, or do you go right to the chick? <coughs> well, that's a good question. Because does the wrist position impact the function of those flexors? Yes. Because when my wrist is flexed, so all you guys flex your wrist, okay, and now try to make a fist. Is it easy or hard? Hard. So you don't want to have the wrist flexed when you start holding the baby chick because you're working against the extrinsic tightness of the extensors. So you want to bring the wrist up into neutral to hold the baby chick. Otherwise, it's, it's and it actually, some protocols, which we're going to see, tell you to extend the wrist when you start doing active motion. Because, you know, go from flexion and try to make a fist, and then go to extension and try to make a fist. Then go to neutral and try to make a fist. The easiest way to make a fist is in full wrist extension. But it's okay to do that in week zero to three. I don't do it in week three. I gradually increase my force to it. So initially I do it with a neutral. Oh, 
Okay, but in week zero and three, you are having Black. to select, and then are you removing the members in the selection? Yeah. So that's okay. That's okay, because I'm not, my attendants aren't working. Okay, because you're doing passively. So, so I'm doing them, passive. Doing active. active, my attendants have to work against these, and if I put my risk in selection, they have to work too hard. You feel it, right? You feel the difference. So then, like the first day, I might just do place and hold. And I'll teach the patient if I'm comfortable, so let them do that at home. And then I might add to just pulling down to a fist. Then I might add to tendon glides. Then I might add to differential glide. Then I might start blocking. But I'm going to slowly increase how much force I give over a period of time while the tendon gets stronger and stronger. But to start, oh, I had the answer on here. Move the wrist and control. Um, but to start, you want to gentle, gentle fisting. And then we don't do strengthening until 8 to 12 weeks. And again, once these patients get to use their hand for functional tasks, they will get strong. Strengthening is not a huge thing in hand therapy. Our goal is to get range of motion. Once you get your patient back to being able to use their hand, I promise you it will get strong. They have, they need to, right? So they will use their hands. So strength, I don't ever keep, oh, you're still a little bit weak. They'll get strong on their own. I'm not going to use their visits working on 10 more pounds of grip strength. They'll get it on their own. But my goal always is to get range of motion. Okay, so let's go through some protocols. This is um, a picture of a Kleiner splint. So with the Kleiner splint, they, they put you in a dorsal blocking splint. In this one, they did suture material to hook you down. Usually, you glue a hook on the fingernail and use a rubber band to hold it down to flexion. The idea with this protocol is that you hold the fingers in greater flexion so that when you extend, it releases that extrinsic healing. It breaks up those adhesions. So that's the whole reason behind this protocol to hold your fingers in more flexion at rest is so that when you actively extend, it, it, you glide naturally, and that releases the adhesions. That's the reason for the Kleiner. When I first started working, everyone did Kleiner's. Now I never see Kleiner anymore. So it's like just all, you know, trends. So these are the positions that you put the, the, the dorsal blocking splint in. The wrist in 45 degrees of flexion, the MPs in flexion, and very critical, you want the splint so the IPs can fully extend. If your splint has IP flexion, you're not going to allow that full extension. You're going to create a digit contracture. Um, you're going to limit your gliding. You want the IPs to be straight in the splint. If they're not straight, you need to remold the splint and make sure that they are straight. It's like that, that Dupuytren's contracture. That patient should have had that splint in as straight as they could get. If you if you don't, your splint is doing harm. Your splint that you made and charged the patient for is creating another problem. Bad. They start active flexion three to six weeks, okay, and strengthen is eight. And, and you look, when you look at all protocols, for the most part, I'm talking fracture, tendon, all things, typically strengthening at eight weeks. Except for those itis things that are a quicker heel, and now those were strengthening at four. But if you're not sure of when to strengthen, and you don't have a resource to go look it up, eight weeks, you can't go wrong. So the doctor is going to indicate when you can go through those phases? The doctor will only tell you, I always get orders for strengthening, and I always get orders for active motion. And with tendons, your patient should be seeing the doctor frequently to monitor what's going on. So you can have constant. So I do, when my patient comes to therapy, I do a progress note and I ask questions. Even to plan for the future. Say there's six weeks out now, can I start strengthening at eight weeks post-op? Can I DC the splint? I'm gonna ask all these questions 
The patient brings it to the doctor, they answer them, the patient brings it back to me, I don't have to make a phone call. Or to interrupt the doctor. Then the doctor has the patient with the question at the same time, real quick, and that's how I do things. It's very efficient. Then there's the Washington Protocol. And the only thing different with that is they add a Palmer pulley to get the finger in even more flexion. This is not a commonly used protocol. Washington. Only difference is they incorporate that Palmer pulley. Duran, frequently used. Still this dorsal blocking splint, okay? But no hooks on the fingers. They're just strapped into, there should be a strap here. The fingers are strapped into the splint. And you have to be careful that you don't want the patient doing something and pulling against the straps, right? So here's the, the splint position. So this is what's typical. 30 degrees of wrist flexion, MPs at 50 to 60 of flexion, IPs in full extension, and this is critical, 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 okay? It, oh, sometimes though with the zone one, you put the DIP joint in flexion for a zone one protocol, so that would be different. Again, you initiate past digit flexion right away, extension to the point of the splint, and then active flexion, three, about three weeks post-op, strengthening at eight weeks, unrestricted 10 to 12. That unrestricted is return to sports, return to heavy work, moving furniture, that kind of thing, right? Strengthening, when they get to this eight week point, they can start to hold a cup to drink from. They can feed themselves with that hand. They can participate in ADL. So it's a long time from point of cut, right, to when they can use their hand for ADL function. Another, so I would say the most commonly used protocols are the Duran protocol and the Indiana protocol. So there are two main sources that drive protocol in the country, Philadelphia Hand Center, Indiana Hand Center. So those are two hand therapy meccas that drive what we do. And um, so Indiana Hand Center, the Indiana Hand Center has its own protocol book, which we have in our resource room if you want to look at it. Um, but the benefit of this protocol is they do a hinged splint with the dorsal blocking splint so that when they do their passive flexion, they hinge the splint so they can move the wrist into extension. And then when they're not doing their exercises, they drop it back down and you put a block in there, a foam block, you know those blocks, the foam you put over a handle for to brush your teeth, just they put a block of foam in there and it keeps it in a flexed position to go back to a dorsal block in the splint. So the difference with the Indiana is just primarily the hinge, the hinged wrist splint. And this was developed by Dr. Strickland and Nancy Cannon as the hand therapist, and they developed this protocol. They have a little bit of variation in the wrist position for the dorsal blocking splint. Um, but otherwise, they still start with uh, the digits passively flexed, and then the patient does a place and hold where they do a gentle muscle contraction and then you let them drop down and they extend. So it's a tenodesis, right? But again, you also have to know, am I doing early active or early passive with these protocols? Because the patient might, might, the doctor might want to follow a Duran protocol, but do early active. Or the doctor might want to do the Indiana. And then the Groff protocol was developed by a therapist, and I'm blanking on her name right now, which is bad. It's Groff. I can't remember the first name. She's from um, uh, St. Louis, and um, she does the Groff protocol based on a pyramid of exercise. So this protocol, in my mind, makes sense 
It makes the most sense, but there was no doctor involved in the development of this protocol. So I never get any referrals for it. <laughs> but it was developed just by a therapist. But the way that she did these pyramids of exercises are, it's a hierarchy where this is the most resistance to the tendon and this is the least resistance to the tendon. And you, you move the patient through the protocol not based on weeks or days, but how the patient presents. Because every patient is so different. So this, this protocol makes such perfect sense to me. So logical, right? If a patient's not doing well, that means there's greater extrinsic healing. I mean, they're not gaining motion. I need to move them through quicker or they're never gonna glide. If they're doing perfectly, not a lot of extrinsic healing, I hold them back. So that's the biggest difference between treating tendon repairs and treating other things. Because you have to base, even with the weak protocol thing, with all the other protocols, you still have to use your clinical judgment. If I am doing a, a, a delayed active motion, I'm starting active motion at three weeks, okay? And I ask the patient to pull the baby chick and they have full flexion and I'm ready to do cartwheels because they're a zone two and I'm so happy I can't even stand it, right? And they extend and they don't have any IP digit contractures and it's like, Right? Like the best outcome ever, right? I'm not going to move them to tendon glides right away. They don't have a lot, of, they're not a big scar maker. So I'm going to hold them back. If I, if I have them, I place them in a flex position and I let go and their finger goes like this, I already have extrinsic healing going on. <coughs> I'm not gliding. Big problems. I need to move them quicker. I need to call the doctor. The patient already has, it, has a, um, a limitation in tendon glide. I'm going to measure how much active flexion they have. And that's a hard thing to grasp because you, usually you would think, oh, the patient's doing great. I'm going to move them quicker. But it's the reverse. With um, I remember one of my first job interviews as a new graduate OT, and I had done my level two. And that was one of the questions they asked me at the interview. It was about this whole thing about how you make decisions about moving tendon repairs through the protocols. Because it's different with tendons than with other things. If patients are doing good, you hold them back. Which makes no sense. Or what you think, right? If they're not doing good, too much extrinsic healing. I need to get them going. I need to get them going. So it's almost like you Treat it more aggressively. Mm -hmm. Too much scar. Okay, so this is just a quote by Roth. You know, where these time-based protocols don't give give you the decisions to make that kind of a choice. At day three, you know, you do this. At day twenty-one, you do this. At six weeks, you do this. That without, you know, all of our patients, we see huge variability in how they do. Right. Yeah. Do you feel that um, reliance on that approach, like with the Groth protocol, might inhibit further research sometimes because, you know, having those baselines are helpful too, right? Right. Having to the know, baselines are essential to have some kind to of... To know that, for instance, like if we had done research to say that six weeks is worse than eight weeks right. or something. Right. Right. Um, do you think that there's I don't any think reliance it will on limit that? Because what limits it is these individual differences, which are going to be, so just because it's six weeks, I hate to hold someone back if I can get them going earlier because they're a big scar maker, just because it says I can't do it for six weeks. But what the, what the value is, is to have this good relationship with your physician, where if you call them and you say, hey, I'm treating Shivani, and I just started active range of motion, she's 22 days post-op, and she has, an, she has a flexion, she's got a lack of tendon glide, and she only has uh, this much motion of the MP, PIP, and DIP with active flexion. 
I'll say, can I progress to this? Or now she's four and a half weeks post-op and she's no better, 